The Cheesecake Factory has almost every kind of cheesecake imaginable, almost. Because nowhere on their 96 page menu will you find placenta. But that's what we're making today. A layered cheesecake from ancient Rome with the unfortunate name of placenta, or placenta, or placenta. I will be doing a rant about that later. So stick around for that and more, this time on Tasting History. It is week four of Rome Month. We made it! Sponsored by the folks over at Creative Assembly to celebrate their release of Total War Rome Remastered out now. So take a look. And to celebrate the game's release, I'm baking a cake. Sort of. See, in De Agricultura by Cato the Elder, he gives us several recipes for cheesecakes, for lack of a better term. And one of those cheesecakes is called placenta, depending on how you pronounce your Latin. And here comes my rant. See, there are several accepted pronunciations of Latin and specific letters and sounds in the language, and none is more contested than the letter C. The letter C. In Roman ecclesiastical, or church Latin, it would be pronounced placenta. In other pronunciations, it would be placenta or placenta, with a soft C, just like we say Caesar. But many reconstructive linguists believe that a C was always pronounced as a K in Old Latin. So it would be placenta, and that would make Caesar Kaiser. And you will find many people who fight over the pronunciation. You'll probably see it in the comments section right now. And from a purely academic perspective, it is rather interesting to, to kind of argue and debate which is right. But when it comes to people who stand by the fact that their version of Latin pronunciation is the one and only true version, I think it's a little bit silly, don't you? Latin was a living and evolving language for over a thousand years, just like English, and it was spoken by all walks of society over a vast empire. In fact, there are ancient Roman writings complaining about how other ancient Romans were pronouncing their Latin. There were probably just as many ways to pronounce Latin as there are English. And English has the added modern benefit of TV and radio to at least somewhat standardize it. The way I pronounce English words is somewhat different than somebody who lives in Orange County just 50 miles away. What? and very, very different from someone who lives in Alabama or New Zealand or Scotland. And I bet it's extremely different from how Henry VIII spoke it, but it's all still English. So until someone finds a recording of the Roman Senate circa 160 BC, or Circa 160 BC, or Circa 160 BC, don't let anyone Latin pronunciation shame you. That said, the pronunciation of today's dish actually probably was placenta because it comes from a Greek word that is spelled with a K. Thus endeth the rant. To make placenta. Two pounds of wheat flour for the crust, four pounds of flour, and two pounds of the best groats for the tractor. Soak the groats in water, and when it becomes quite soft, pour into a clean bowl, drain well, and knead with your hands. When it is well kneaded, work in the four pounds of flour gradually. This dough is to make the tracta, and spread them out in a basket to dry. When they are dry, coat them with oil. Then moisten the two pounds of flour, knead, and form a thin lower crust. Soak 14 pounds of sheep's cheese, not sour and quite fresh, in water. Soften it, changing the water three times. When the cheese is well dried, knead it in a clean bowl by hand and make it as smooth as possible. Add four and a half pounds of fine honey and mix it well with the cheese. Place the crust on oiled bay leaves and form the placenta. First, place down a single tracta, spread it with the mixture from the bowl, add the tracta one by one, covering each layer until you have used up all the cheese and honey. On the top, place a single tracta, and then fold over the crust. Then put the placenta in the oven, cover with a hot crock, and surround with coals. When it is done, remove and spread with honey. This will make a half-modious cake. So this cake was huge, though it was meant as a religious offering, so it's ancient Rome, so you got a lot of gods to feed. But I'm cutting it down because I don't need to be buying 14 Roman pounds of cheese, so for this recipe what you'll need is 2 thirds cup or 120 grams of groats, preferably spelt or emmer, 2 cups or 240 grams of wheat flour, 3 quarters of a cup or 177 milliliters of water, and 1 tablespoon of olive oil. That is for the tracta. For the crust you'll need 1 cup or 120 grams of flour, and a quarter cup or 59 milliliters of water. 
For the filling, you'll need 1 and 3 fourths pound or 790 grams of sheep's cheese. You can also use cow's cheese, that's fine. Just make sure it's like kind of crumbly. And 3 fourths of a cup or 255 grams of honey. Plus some bay leaves with olive oil to coat them. So first, let's make our tractor. Now last week I made tractor for the roast pig, and this week I'm making it very similarly, but slightly differently just to, you know, see how it turns out. So take your groats and grind them just a bit. You want to leave them quite coarse. Then add the water and let them soak for about a day. Last week's finer semolina just had to soak for 20 minutes. These need to soak for about a day before you get them nice and mushy. Then incorporate them with the flour to make the dough. You can add more water if necessary, but do it sparingly because you want this to be pretty dry. Knead the dough for about 10 minutes until it's nice and smooth, then divide it into four to six pieces and roll into discs. Kato is not specific in how many layers this cake is going to be. It kind of depends on the size of your dish, uh, but they should be rolled out fairly thin. Think like a flour tortilla. Then lay them out to dry. This can take a while, especially if you're somewhere that it's humid. Granted, I'm in LA, so mine dried overnight. In fact, probably a little too much. They were pretty hard and dry, though not as hard as the hardtack. And then we make the crust. Now this is not a nice flaky pie crust or like a phyllo dough, which modern versions of this cake are made with phyllo dough. I'm sure they're fantastic. This is going to be very different because it's just water and flour. So mix the flour with the water until it comes together to form a dough. And don't feel that you need to use all of the water. If it comes together before you've used it all, stop. Then roll it out to be a large disc about twice as wide as you want your cake to be. It can be more or less, but try to make it as big as you can because we are going to be wrapping this cake. The last component is our filling, and Kato says to wash the cheese or rinse it in water three times. And that was because the cheese would have been very, very salty. So it was to get the salt out. So depending on the cheese that you have, you might not need to do it three times. I did do it three times because I had fairly salty cheese and because it made it softer each time I did it, and you want this to be nice and soft. So rinse your cheese and then drain it as much as possible, then mash it up until it's nice and smooth. Then mix in the honey until well incorporated, and it is time to assemble our placenta. By the way, placenta, as in like the thing that a baby grows inside of, was actually named after the cake. So clearly somebody saw placenta one day and thought, Mmm, that looks like cake. So line a dish with oiled bay leaves. These should help flavor the cake as well as stop it from sticking to the dish. Then set your crust in over the leaves. Then brush one of the tractor with oil and set it in the middle of the dish and then spread some cheese and honey mixture on top. Cover that with another oiled tractor and repeat until you've used up all of the filling, finishing with an oiled tractor on top. Then fold over the crust to enclose the cake as much as you can then cover the dish and set it in an oven at 300 degrees Fahrenheit or 150 Celsius for about 70 minutes. Now we have covered the lives of several recipe writers here on the show, but they all pale in comparison to Cato the Elder. See, his father died young and Cato inherited the family farm and so he had to learn all about farming at a young age, hence later on writing De Agricultura, which means on farming or on agriculture. But Cato lived in extraordinary times. And as the old song says, how are you going to keep them down on the farm after they've seen Paris? Though in this case, it's after he's seen Hannibal. In 218 BC, Hannibal Barca paraded a bunch of elephants and Carthaginians across the Alps and into Italy to make a right mess of things. Well, being a teenager coming from military stock, Marcus Porcius Cato, Cato, and yes, Porcius was his middle name, or Porcius. If anyone can find me a picture or draw me a picture of Porky the Pig in like ancient Roman garb, I would just love that. Share that with me on Instagram. Anyway, Marcus Porcius Cato left the family farm to go fight in the Second Punic War, where he quickly rose to the rank of military tribune under the general Quintus Fabius Maximus Verucosus. This poor guy was named Verucosus to delineate him from other members of his family. And Verucosus means wart or warty because he had a wart on his upper lip. That's just got to wreak havoc on a kid's self-esteem, right? Mm. Anyway, he turned out all right, as did Cato. Because after distinguishing himself in the war, he was befriended by the wealthy and powerful Lucius Valerius Flaccus, who convinced Cato to move to the city of Rome and enter politics. Cato soon became known for his austerity, his traditional Roman principles, and his dogged persecution of moral decay. 
He was undoubtedly a man of a rough temper and a bitter and unbridled tongue, an absolute master of his passions, of inflexible integrity, and indifferent alike to wealth and popularity. Something makes me think that he was a bit like the ancient Roman Rex Banner. Rex Banner! I'm running this department now. Though unlike Rex Banner, who was a fan of Trial by Catapult, <laughs> Cato helped to limit cruel and unusual punishment. But unusual laws? Not so much. He was an avid proponent of the Lex Opia, or Opian Laws, and these were a set of sumptuary laws, or consumption laws, put in place during the Second Punic War to help Rome kind of bolster its depleted war chest. But they were mostly aimed toward women. How much money women could have, what they could wear, what colors, what fabrics, and if they could take carriages and at what time and where. And after the war, many thought that the laws were no longer necessary and should be repealed. And the women of Rome took to the streets to make their displeasure known. But Cato was not persuaded. I should like to be told what it is that has led these matrons to rush out into the streets in a tumult. What excuse is offered for this present feminine insurrection? We want to gleam with purple and gold, says one of them, and to ride in our carriages on festal days and on ordinary days. We want no limit to our spending and our extravagance. You have often heard my complaints about the excessive spending of the women, a plague which has been the destruction of all great empires. And somehow this man convinced two women to marry him in his lifetime. Now the laws were repealed, but his opposition made Cato more popular than ever, first with many, many citizens, and then with his soldiers, because he re-entered military life, where he ate and worked alongside his men and led them to a number of victories both in Spain and Greece. And that gave him the clout to return to the capital and begin a public indictment of Rome's most famous and well-respected general, Scipio Africanus, the man who defeated Hannibal. Cato believed that Scipio had become a little big for his britches and accused him of corruption, which was probably true, and Scipio ended up retiring from public life. Cato was so good at persecuting the actions of others that he ended up becoming one of the most famous censors in Roman history. A censor was an official job title, and they were in charge of maintaining public morality, amongst other things. Truly the perfect job for dear old Cato. One thing he tried to stamp out was the growing influence of the Hellenistic culture of Greece on the Roman people. Their religion, literature, and language were all becoming very popular in the Republic, and he saw that as degrading the traditional Roman values. The man did not like change, unless that change involved limiting the wealth of women. Because a few years after the Lex Opia was repealed, he supported a set of new laws called the Lex Orcia, which did many of the same things. In addition, they limited the number of guests someone could have at feasts and other gatherings. There were some very weird laws. But Cato's most infamous object of scorn is epitomized in his line, Carthago de lenda est, Carthage must be destroyed. He used to say it after every speech in the Senate, whether the preceding speech had anything to do with Carthage or not. But by this time, Cato was a fairly old man, and so he could remember the Second Punic War and the havoc that was wrought by Hannibal and Carthage on the Roman people. And he was seeing that Carthage was becoming strong again. In one story, which I actually mentioned in my video on figs, one of my very first videos, uh, Cato is upset and, and frustrated with the younger senators and their inability to see Carthage as a threat. They think that it's too far away to pose any real danger. Burning with a moral hatred of Carthage, Cato one day brought with him into the Senate House a ripe fig, the produce of that country. Showing it to the assembled senators, he said, Know that this fig was plucked at Carthage but the day before yesterday. That is how near the enemy is to our walls. And according to Pliny the Elder, that is what started the Third Punic War. It's probably not true, but that's what Pliny wrote. Though anything that Pliny has to say, especially on Cato, kind of suspect, because he, I believe the term is stand Cato, he just loved Cato and everything that he did. Um, yeah, he had a lot of influence on him. Sadly, Cato never got to see the destruction of Carthage because he died before it happened. But before he died, he left us perhaps his most lasting legacy in his writings on agriculture, the Agricultura. 
it's one of the first significant pieces of Latin prose, and it had an influence on other Roman writings for centuries, including Pliny. And while there are several recipes in it, as well as lots of information on other foods and ingredients and growing practices of the time, it's really a treatise on how to run a farm profitably as a business. Business. And it's in those sections that you get some of Cato's more bleh advice. The most bleh being that he thinks that you should cut the rations of slaves if they're not working hard enough, and when they get old or if they're sick, instead of taking care of them, which was the practice at the time, you should just sell them, just get rid of them, not your problem anymore. Not really a very nice guy from our modern perspective, but from his perspective, and from the perspective of many of his contemporaries, he embodied all of the virtues and qualities of a traditional Roman citizen. As he wrote, when they would praise a worthy man, their praise took the form, good husband, good farmer. It is from the farming class that the bravest men and the sturdiest soldiers come. So I suppose it's important that you know how to farm, and by extension, know how to make a good placenta cake, if you want to be the kind of soldier who can build an empire like you will in Total War Rome Remastered. Once the placenta has baked for 70 minutes, it should be ready to eat. Though, if you want to darken it up a little bit just for some color, you can take the top off of the pot and cook it for another 10 minutes. Now, this wouldn't have been an issue if I had just heaped coals on top of it, like the recipe said, but I'm told that I'm not allowed to put coals in our oven anymore, so I just took the top off. So after 10 minutes, take it out of the oven and slather it in honey. And here we are, Cato's placenta. That sounds really gross, and now you know why it's better to say placenta. Slice it open to see the layers. Fairly defined. It's actually really pretty, uh, that sheen of the honey on top. Let's get a piece here. Okay, it does not, um, <laughs> it does not hold together very well. Kind of like falling apart. Let's try it. Hmm. What's not to love? It's honey and cheese. You really get the bay leaf, though. The dominant flavor is definitely the honey, but the bay leaf is really, really strong in a good way. It's, it's refreshing. It's really, really nice. The texture, I can see why they go with phyllo dough now. Um, and now, I don't know that this is exactly the, the width of, uh, of Tracta that he made, but it's a little, it's a little chewy. I think it's absorbed a lot of the oil and the honey and the cheese mixture and everything, so it's a little chewy. Crisp. It's crisp and chewy. Is that a thing? I don't even know. I wish it was more like just, well, I wish it was phyllo dough. It's still really good, though. So thank you all for sticking with me for an entire month of Roman recipes, and thank you Creative Assembly and Total War Rome Remastered for sponsoring the month and giving me uh, the impetus to actually do it. It's been a lot of fun. Also, they're going to be giving me some free game codes to, to give out. So follow me on Instagram. I'm probably going to do most of the giving there because it's easier to to follow people and everything um, rather than in the comments here. So follow me on Instagram, and I will see you next time on Tasting History.